The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller Book Summary Strong, swift and beautiful, irresistible to all who meet him, the best of all the Greeks, Achilles is a son of the cruel sea goddess Thetis and the legendary king Peleus. While Patroclus is an awkward young prince, exiled from his homeland after an act of shocking violence, brought together by chance, they forge an inseparable bond despite risking the god's wrath. In a world where gods, demigods and people all live together, the Song of Achilles is the love story of Patroclus and Achilles. The book unfolds a dazzling, profoundly moving and utterly unique retelling of the legend of the Greek demigod Achilles and the Trojan War. Out of very ancient stories, Miller's book presents a modern work of literature, bringing forth an action-packed adventure bursting palpable emotions. A devastating love story and an almighty battle between Greek gods and kings, immortal fame and the human heart, peace and glory, The Song of Achilles is indeed a must-read. The Song of Achilles is a 2011 novel by American writer Madeline Miller. Set during the Greek heroic age, it is an adaptation of Homer's Iliad as told from the perspective of Patroclus. The novel follows Patroclus's relationship with Achilles, from their initial meeting to their exploits during the Trojan War, focusing on their romantic relationship. The author depicts Achilles and Patroclus as the same age, contrasting Homer's depiction of Patroclus as significantly older than Achilles. This book took her 10 years to write, and after discarding a completed manuscript, Five years into her writing, she started again from scratch, struggling to perfect the voice of her narrator. No summary can convey the author's words, so we highly recommend you read the book, but let's peek inside and get you even more interested. The Song of Achilles is told from the perspective of Achilles' lover, Patroclus, a young Greek prince who grows up with a father disappointed by Patroclus's mediocrity. When he is nine years old, his father takes him to Sparta, where Patroclus presents himself as a suitor for Helen. She chooses her husband, Menelaus, from all the suitors, and the rest of the men make an oath that they will defend her choice. Patroclus is exiled to Pythia after accidentally killing the son of one of his father's nobles. There he meets Achilles, the son of Pythia's king Peleus, and the sea goddess Thetis. They become great friends, and Patroclus develops feelings for Achilles. Believing that a low-status moral is an unacceptable companion for her son, Thetis attempts to separate the pair by sending Achilles to study under Chiron for two years, but Patroclus joins him in his trainings. As their romance develops, the Mycenaean monarch Agamemnon summons the different Achaeans to join his military expedition against Troy whose prince Paris has kidnapped his brother Menelaus' wife, Helen. When a prophecy predicts that Achilles will die at Troy, following the death of the Trojan prince Hector, Thetis disguises Achilles as a woman in King Lycomedes' court and compels him to marry Lycomedes' daughter, Didymia, who subsequently carries Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. Patroclus accompanies Achilles to Skyros, where they live until Odysseus and Diomedes locate them. Patroclus is compelled to join the battle in Troy due to his blood pledge, but Achilles enters after pledging never to confront Hector in order to avoid his foretold death. As Achilles joins the Achaean army, tensions between him and Agamemnon rise. First, when Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia to placate Artemis, and later when Achilles steals the Trojan lady Briseis as a war prize in order to save her from Agamemnon. Agamemnon claims Chryseis after nine years. Soon after, Chryseis tries to pay for her freedom, but Agamemnon refuses. As Agamemnon resists Achilles' demand to surrender Chryseis, he doubles down by blaming Achilles for the war's duration and for his hesitation to confront and kill Hector. As a punishment, he orders that Briseis be taken from Achilles and brought to him, which offends Achilles, who promises to remove himself and his troops from the conflict until the slight that his dignity is repaired. To precipitate the Greeks' desire for Achilles, Thetis persuades Zeus to shift the conflict in favor of the Trojans so that the Achaeans will regret having antagonized Achilles and the Achaeans suffer enormous casualties. 
As Achilles refuses to accept a secret agreement in which Briseis is delivered to him along with rich presents, tensions between him and Patroclus rise. He insists on a public apology while refusing to help the Greeks who are on the verge of defeat. Patroclus, a field medic who has gotten close to the warriors and sympathizes with their losses, tries and fails to persuade Achilles to rejoin the battle. Instead, Patroclus disguises himself as Achilles and leads his warriors into combat, forcing the Trojans to withdraw. Apollo prompts Patroclus to unveil himself during the combat. Hector kills Patroclus and his body is handed to Achilles. Achilles grieves along with Briseis and requests that Patroclus' ashes be blended with his own when he dies. Achilles, having lost his desire to live, returns to combat and kills Hector in order to avenge Patroclus. Once he is murdered by Paris, his ashes are combined with Patroclus's and buried at his request. As Briseis denies his advances and betrays Achilles and Patroclus' connection, Neoptolemus comes to take Achilles' place and has her slain. At the request of Neoptolemus, the Achaeans build a tomb for Achilles and Patroclus but do not inscribe Patroclus' name. Patroclus' shadow is therefore unable to enter the underworld and is imprisoned in the tomb. Thetis returns after the war to mourn for Achilles. She and Patroclus exchange memories and Thetis gives in, writing Patroclus' name on the grave. Patroclus may now enter the afterlife, where he and Achilles reconnect. The novel immediately and efficiently makes clear that women in this society have very little power or agency. First, Patroclus' father marries Patroclus' mother not for love but for money. He marries her for her dowry. Second, the fact that she smiles at her wedding, indicating that she is happy to get married, is taken as incontrovertible evidence that she is simple-minded. This suggests that quote-unquote normal women are aware that marriage makes them powerless. The novel also quickly establishes the gender expectations for men in this society. They should be strong and physically talented. Patroclus' father's disdain for Patroclus shows how society treats men who don't meet that expectation. Patroclus' father can't recognize the physical strength Patroclus does have, like being healthy, and protects himself from the embarrassment of being the father of such a boy by suspiciously wondering if, in fact, he isn't his father. This passage illustrates the kind of boy his father would like Patroclus to be. The young boy who wins the tournament is athletic and strong, and having those traits is directly tied to that boy being seen as worthy and therefore being accepted and loved by his father and society. The description of the blonde princess quote-unquote flashing heels is a moment of foreshadowing as that blonde prince will grow up to be Achilles, whose heels end up being very significant. Meanwhile, the Peleus is kind and has a goodness for a wife suggests that there is a perhaps another way to be a man in this society that offers better results than those practiced by Patroclus' father. Women are not only subordinate to men in this society but also to gods, who can apparently sexually assault them. In Greek mythology, Zeus is the ruler of the gods and is essentially all-powerful. This girl's mother wouldn't have stood a chance against him. In addition, the sexual assault seems to be okay with everyone else, as the story is clearly widely known. Once again, it is made obvious that marriages are not based on love at all if a nine-year-old can be sent to woo a young woman. And once again, Patroclus' father proves that he is only concerned about how others perceive him. The soldier's small kindness to Patroclus is the first glimpse of goodwill in the novel, and as a result, the dice seem like significant objects. In the end, the only people who cry for Achilles are the ones who didn't know him, and they cry not for who he was but for his lost beauty. Achilles' final act of kindness, returning Hector's body, may have redeemed him to some degree, but clearly Phoenix was right and some people will never forgive him for refusing to fight. No one has a real reason to mourn Achilles except for Thetis, but her last conversation with Achilles ended their relationship on a complicated note. The fact that Thetis allows the mixing of the ashes suggests that even though she hated Patroclus and his influence on her son, she never wanted Achilles to be unhappy. 
In Greek mythology, Achilles is famous for having only one vulnerable spot on his body, his heel. According to legend, Achilles' mother dipped him in the river Styx to make him invincible, and it worked everywhere except for the heel where she held him. In some myths, Achilles would later die by being shot in his heel. Madeline Miller's version of the story does not include this vulnerable heel. She felt that it stretched credibility to believe that someone could die via an injury to their heel, and Achilles' supposed invincibility wasn't part of Homer's Iliad. The author credits her background in theater with helping her focus the novel. She says that she wrote the story by getting into Patroclus' skin and allowing his lived experiences to dictate the novel's emotional beats, which is described as writing the story, quote-unquote, from inside rather than out. This brings us to the end of today's video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell button to get notified whenever there's a new book summary ready for you.